What kind of mother wouldn't love their daughter? I'm one of these daughters. I really struggled to feel loved by my mom pretty much my whole life. And today we're going to go over this article from Psychology Today written by Peg Streep entitled Seven Common Wounds for Daughters of Unloving Mothers. Let's dive into the effect that unloving and selfish mothers have on their children, especially their daughters. Hi, I'm Maddie with the Anti-Alienation Project and welcome or welcome back. Here I talk about everything related to a certain form of severe child psychological abuse known as parental alienation. You might be wondering what the heck is parental alienation in the first place. This is something that usually happens with a, one parent, one really angry parent, often during a custody dispute or divorce, but not always goes on an obsessive rampage and manipulates their child to reject their other loving parent without true justification. This happened to me and from the age of nine to about 28, I rejected my dad. I never spent the night at his house. I was made to believe lies about him, that he was abusive, selfish, narcissistic, that he didn't love me, all done by my mom. Not only did my mom destroy my relationship with my dad for 20 years, but she also alienated me from him in order to isolate and control me. And that way I didn't have the protection of my other parent because I didn't allow him in my life for the most part. So she was able to get away with a lot of other types of abuse. I am really well-versed in unloving mothers and what it's like to have one of these mothers. I will give my two main disclaimers, which is number one, I'm not an expert, not a therapist, not a researcher. I am just coming with the 20 years of lived experience. And then number two, I don't speak for all former alienated children. I don't speak for all daughters who have an unloving mother. I'm coming from my own experience and it won't necessarily reflect the experience of all people who might go some, through something similar. So today's article, Seven Common Wounds for Daughters of Unloving Mothers, why these wounds are common is amply explained by attachment theory, first proposed by John Bowlby and then expanded on by the work of Mary Ainsworth. In infancy and childhood, a daughter catches the first glimpse of herself in the mirror that is her mother's face. Yeah, it's such a big responsibility. One that, as a mother myself, I do not take lightly. The article continues to say, if her mother is loving and attuned, the baby is securely attached. She learns both that she is loved and lovable. That sense of being lovable, worthy of affection and attention, of being seen and heard, provides the bedrock on which she builds her earliest sense of self and provides the energy for its growth. The daughter of an unloving mother one who is emotionally distant, withholding, inconsistent, or even hypercritical and cruel, that's my experience, learns different lessons about the world and herself. A little bit scared to hear the rest of this. The underlying problem, of course, is how dependent a human infant is on her mother for nurturance and survival. What results is insecure attachment characterized as either ambivalent which means that the child doesn't know whether the good mommy or the bad one will show up or avoidant which is where the daughter wants her mother's love but is afraid of the consequences of seeking it ambivalent attachment teaches the child that the world of a relationship is unreliable. Avoidant attachment sets up a terrible conflict between the child's needs, both for her mother's love and for protection against her mother's abuse. It's just a mind boggling experience being dependent on your parent and wanting them to love you at the same time needing to protect yourself from the harm they consistently cause you and refuse to stop causing you. It's very complex, very confusing. And what happens for me, at least, and many other of my friends I've talked to, you grow up associating love with abuse. This is something I don't hear a lot of people talking about enough because when you are growing up and you associate love with being hurt, with being criticized, with being put down, humiliated, shamed, abused, that's gonna carry over into your adult life. When you go to find a romantic relationship, for example, it's very common for those of us who've been abused in childhood to go on into adulthood and when we find a partner that is critical, that is mean or abusive, unloving, we don't know that they're mean, abusive, or unloving because that's what we're used to. That's what we think love is. So when we find a partner who treats us poorly or, or even abuses us severely, we think it's love. 
this is hard for someone to understand who hasn't been through this type of childhood abuse by a parent, but it really is so familiar and so normal to us that it actually feels comfortable. On the flip side, if we find a relationship with someone who's really healthy-minded in normal range, that can feel uncomfortable when we're not used to having unconditional healthy love. But, and we might mistake stability for boredom. It might feel really uncomfortable and we might not even like that. So when a mother or father teaches their child that love means getting hurt and being hurt, we will associate love with being hurt. It's the most natural outcome. That's why it's so important for children who've been through this chronic abuse by a parent to realize, number one, they've been abused. The truth. They need to learn the truth. Number two, it's not okay to have been treated like that. It's not okay for people to treat you like that. It's not okay for you to treat other people like that. That way, they will realize what's happening happen to them and they can start to heal themselves, become healthier themselves, and naturally they will not be drawn to that same abusive pattern. And when they f date people, hopefully, if they're in a healing recovery away from their abusive parent, they will, if they do happen to wind up in a relationship with someone who is treating them like their parent used to treat them, they will realize, aha, this reminds me of the way that my parent treated me. I hate this. This is not a healthy relationship for me. But if you don't have that realization about your parent and you still accept that treatment and think it's normal, when another partner treats you like that down the road, you won't have that same reaction. You will just be like, oh, okay, this is how I'm supposed to be treated. It's, this is normal. This is right. The article continues by saying, according to attachment theory, early attachments form our internal templates or mental representations of how relationships work in the world. Without therapy or intervention, these mental representations tend to be relatively stable. That's what I was just saying. The key point is that a daughter's need for her mother's love is a primal driving force, and that need doesn't diminish with unavailability. Just because the mother may be unavailable or unwilling to put their child's needs first doesn't mean that the child's needs go away. It coexists with the terrible and damaging understanding that the one person who is supposed to love you without conditions doesn't. The struggle to heal and cope is a mighty one. You can say that again and again and again. It affects many, if not all, parts of yourself, especially in the area of relationships. When people do talk about this, it seems like they talk about romantic relationships, but let's not stop there. This affects your relationships with friends, forming friendships. This affects your relationships with your kids, feeling loved and expressing love. This affects every human relationship, not just romantic relationships. For example, when I first had kids, I felt like I was not worthy of my daughter's love. It's something hard to admit. That's something I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit. She deserved the best mother in the world and that can't be me. Because of this inner belief that has been really hard to shake, that I'm still trying to work on, is that I'm unworthy. I'm not good enough. And that's a very common negative belief that a lot of alienated children develop, seeing how much she loves me. And it was overwhelming and I felt like I didn't deserve it for a long time. So this doesn't just affect your romantic relationships, it affects your relationships with your kids. And that's something that I need, I've been working on very diligently and I will never stop working on because my kids need to have a loving mother. The article continues by saying, the point of looking at these wounds isn't to bemoan them or to throw up on our hands and despair at the mother love cards we were dealt, but to become conscious and aware of them. Consciousness is the first step in an unloved daughter's healing. All too often, we simply accept these behaviors in ourselves without considering their point of origin. But let's get into these seven common wounds of daughters of unloving mothers. If it were a bingo game, I think I would win. So number one is a lack of confidence. The unloved daughter doesn't know that she is lovable or worthy of attention. She may have grown up feeling ignored or unheard or criticized at every turn. Ding, ding. Yes. Criticism. There was unrelenting criticism, I can never do anything right. The voice in her head is that of her mother's, telling her what she isn't. She isn't smart, she isn't beautiful, she isn't kind, loving, or worthy. That internalized maternal voice will continue to undermine her accomplishments and talents unless there is some sort of intervention. Thank God I did the intervention. 
putting up a boundary or going on no contact with an unloving mother, in doing so, I believe you're putting your self-respect first. You're putting your own family, your marriage, your kids first because the effects of the unloving mother will continue to seep into you, into your children, into your marriage, into your life. Is it loving to allow someone to abuse you? Is it loving to enable someone to abuse you and your children? No. It's actually the loving thing, in my point of view, to say no to abuse, even if it is your own parent, because you're not enabling them to continue to abuse you. Daughters sometimes talk about feeling that they are, quote unquote, fooling people and express fear that they will be found out when they enjoy success in the world. This reminds me of imposter syndrome, which I do get a lot, which is just anytime you do have exciting opportunities or if you do have any accomplishments or achievements that are really awesome, it's hard to take credit for them because we have this wound that we're unworthy. Number two, lack of trust. Ding, 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 I have this one too. It says, I always wonder, one woman confides, why someone wants to be my friend. I can't help myself from thinking whether there's some kind of hidden agenda. And I've learned in therapy that that has everything to do with my mother. These trust issues emanate from that sense of relationships are fundamentally unreliable. Trust and the inability to set boundaries are, as it happens, closely connected. And yeah, I think it's really hard to trust other people when the one person you're supposed to trust, your mother, is not trustworthy. Number three is difficulty setting boundaries. I think that is goes hand in hand with being a people pleaser. I never thought I was a people pleaser, but now I realize I have a really hard problem with saying no. I will beat myself up for saying no to people. So I think that is related. It says, many daughters caught between their need for their mother's attention and its absence report that they become pleasers in adult relationships or they are unable to set boundaries which make for healthy and emotionally sustaining relationships. A number of unloved daughters report problems with maintaining close female friendships which are complicated due to issues of trust. How do I know she's really my friend? So with the trust issue, they've basically separated the unloved daughters into two categories which is one, fearful and two, dismissive. Both share the same avoidance of intimacy, but for different reasons. The fearful actively seek close relationships, but are afraid of intimacy on all levels. The dismissives are armored and detached, perhaps defensively. They're Avoidance is more straightforward and both types are not able to get the kind of emotional connection that could move them closer to healing. If I reflect on my earlier romantic relationships in, say, high school, I could definitely see how I struggled big time in romantic relationships. But now, 15 years later, I've gotten through that a lot of that because I don't have those same symptoms anymore. Number four is difficulty seeing the self accurately. One woman shares that what she has finally learned in therapy is that when I was a child, my mother held me back by focusing on my flaws, never my accomplishments. After college, I had a number of jobs, but at every one, my boss complained that I wasn't pushing hard enough to try to grow. It was only then that I realized I was limiting myself, adopting my mother's view of me in the world. Much of this has to do with internalizing all that you heard growing up. These distortions in how we see ourselves may extend into every domain, including our looks. Ding, ding. Yeah, that's true. It's crazy because I think that has to do with like really poor body image and perfectionism too. Other daughters report feeling surprised when they succeed at something, <laughs> that's how I feel, as well as being hesitant to try something new so that you can reduce the possibility of failure. This isn't just a question of low self-esteem, but something much more profound. This is really sad. This is really sad. Growing up, it's hard to put the pieces together, of course, and as a young adult or adolescent or a teenager, I never considered that my mom could be jealous or envious of me, never. But I think it was more that she was jealous of the fact that I was young or the fact that I had my life ahead of me. Don't really know if it was me particularly, but even small comments made again and again have a huge impact on a daughter and her self-conception. One thing that has had a huge impact on me in the past would be that my mom would often tell me, talk about her body with me and talk about her weight with me. And she would tell me numbers as she would say, for example, I've never been above this many pounds 
And so then in my head, I developed the belief that I should never get above that many pounds. And I took it a step further, which was, okay, so if my mom believes that women should never be above this amount, and we are the same height, so I, then I can take it a step further. And not only will I stay below that number, but I'll go even lower than that number so I can be really good. It just causes so many issues. Number five is making avoidance the default position. I'm not really sure what they mean by this, so let's check it out. Lacking confidence or feeling fearful sometimes put the unloved daughter in a defensive crouch so that she's avoiding being hurt by a bad connection rather than being motivated to possibly find a stable and loving one. These women on the surface may act as though they want to be in a relationship, but on a deeper, less conscious level, avoidance is their motivator. Unfortunately, avoidance, whether fear, mistrust, or something else triggers it, actively presents the unloved daughter from finding the kind of love and supportive relationship she's always sought ding ding that resonates with me like waiting for the other shoe to drop with other people because you just expect other people to be treating you the way that you are used to being treated number six is being overly sensitive an unloved daughter may be sensitive to slights real or imagined a random comment may carry the weight of her child experience without her even being aware of it quote i've had to really focus on my reactions or better put overreactions end quote says one woman now in her 40s quote Sometimes I mistake what's meant as banter as something else and I end up worrying about it to death until I shake myself and realize the person really meant nothing by it. Having a mother who's unattuned also means that unloved daughters often have trouble managing their emotions. They tend to overthink and ruminate as well. Yeah, that's been me for sure in the past. Yes, I've had to learn how to regulate my emotions in adulthood because I was never shown or given an example of how to do that. Yeah, this is definitely something we have to learn how to do so that we can help our own children down the line learn how to regulate their emotions and so that we don't repeat the cycle and make it worse for our own kids. Finally, number seven is replicating the, ah, no, replicating the mother bond in relationships. Yikes. Alas, it says, we tend to be drawn to what we know. Those situations which, while they make us unhappy in the end, are nonetheless comfortable because they're familiar to us. This is what I was talking about at the beginning of the video. While securely attached individuals tend to go out into the world seeking people who have similar histories of attachment, unluckily, so do the ambivalently and avoidantly attached. This sometimes has the effect of replicating the maternal relationship. Quote, I married my mother for sure says one woman. He was on the surface completely different from my mother, but in the end, he treated me much the same way. Like my mother, he was indifferent and attentive by turns. Horribly critical, and she ended up divorcing both her husband and her mother. <laughs> yeah, it's not surprising why people repeat the cycle. And even if they do realize what they've been through and how they've been mistreated, often they've already gone on to repeat the cycle and it is too late in some regards. As the article ends, with this list in mind, the day a daughter takes stock of her wounds is the first day of her healing and her journey towards new self-awareness and possibility. Let's toast to the healing and to all the tomorrows. I think that's a helpful article. I will link it in the description below. If this were a bingo game, again, I would have won because I had all seven common wounds from an unloving mother. To end this video, I want to take it a step further and talk about what do we do when we don't have that example in our own mother of how to love our children unconditionally. How do we change things for our own children? And this is something I've worked through in therapy. My therapist question for me was, what influence did I have of a mother's unconditional love outside of my own mom? And it certainly was my dad's mother, my grandma. I'm super close to her, always have been. I was not alienated from my extended family. I think that's because my four younger brothers were not alienated, so I still saw my grandparents, my dad's parents. And my dad's mom, my momo, is the most kind, caring, patient, unconditionally loving mother I've ever met. And she's my grandma so i'm really lucky and so what i do is i channel my mama i do what my mama would do i treat my kids how my mama would treat me when i was a kid and i had that source of unconditional love in her i always have so you don't necessarily need to have 
a, a wonderful mother. You definitely can take everything that your unloving mother has done and said and shown you and use it as a blueprint for what not to do. Now you can learn from her mistakes and you can find another example of true unconditional positive regard and how to show that to your children. That's what my mama has done for me. I love her so much. Thank you, Mama. I hope this video has been insightful or helpful for someone out there. If you are a daughter of an unloving mother, I just want to say I am so sorry. You're not alone. We have this misconception in society that all mothers are selfless and loving, and it's just very far from the case. It's not the case. I hope you know that just because you had an unloving mother doesn't mean you are unworthy of love. I hope that this video has helped some people out there. You're not alone. I'll see you next time. Bye.